<laughs> so so hi everybody um so um so um, mark and i are going to talk about um the characteristics of expertise for online teaching we're focusing on online teaching um in higher education um and just a, just a quick word and i'm going to hand over to mark we're going to sort of um, swap around a little bit but basically we've we've both experienced the same phenomenon in different um english um uh, university uh, english university context so some staff regardless of perhaps their previous experience um, of online teaching have really disliked teaching online and this came through came through the pandemic and they couldn't wait to get back to um, in-person teaching and what we've done for the purpose of this presentation of, of 10 minutes is really we've extracted um, some of that research and I think that the key point is that if we accept that blended distance as well as um, in-person teaching is needed going forward, um, it's useful for us to look at this and then have, look at the implications for how we might approach supporting staff to develop their online um, teaching practice. So I'm going to move on and hand over to Mark. Oh, thanks, Sarah. So, yeah, the where where I started off with this was with um, looking at the digital, um, the JISC Digital Insights Survey and analysing the staff responses there. And at Durham, um, yes, some people had some experience in online learning to start with, but most were going from a complete zero baseline. And the experiences and the way that they engaged over the lockdowns um, was really quite different. We would have quite a few in the middle, but there were some at both extremes who actually had responded in very, very different ways. And um, before I started to collaborate with Sarah, I tried to identify one or two reasons why this might be. Um, and uh, using Winch et al, which we'll talk about more in the paper, which hopefully we'll produce after this. And then Sarah mentioned Helen King's idea of um, artistry, and that's where we kind of started collaborating and coming up with a framework that might help us understand where these differences come from. And um, and so what we were hoping is that you'll listen to our framework and then feed back any ideas about what we might be missing or how we can expand or whether or not this actually sounds like a plausible avenue to go back to when we're investigating the data a bit more. So if we have a look at the next slide, um, so this was some of the examples of quotes I had about people that were a bit more positive about it. And it was all about the fact that this was a new way of learning, that it was providing new things that people could use in their in their, their teaching. Um, so we had, um, uh, you know, it would become um, an online, it will be a, a, an integral way of moving forwards with this sort of stuff. And that that was very positive reading these sorts of responses. But if we look at the next slide, we got a similar number of people at the other extreme that were saying things like, we've got to get rid of this as soon as possible. Um, it's uh, if uh, somebody said that if we have to do this after lockdown's over, I will quit teaching. And it wasn't so much that they felt that the their experiences, that it was an, an, it was poor experience for teaching. It was almost an ideological opposition to the whole idea of online of online teaching as being a way to move forward. So, um, yeah, if we look at the, yeah, so that was basically the data and where we came from. So, Sarah, if you want to to follow up with your bit. Yeah. So, um, and, and also, I we haven't put the data in here in the interest of time, but I had similar similar experiences of people either, you know, um, really, in, you know, enjoying it and wanting to continue and others who just said, if I, if I don't go back to in-person teaching and there were some disciplinary context for that as well, then I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to quit teaching. So what we were interested in from an academic development perspective, what we're interested in and what we can also learn from this is about supporting teaching staff with the adoption of new techniques and it comes from a background and experience of introducing, for example, uh, in my own case, activity said learning into engineering, computing and, and mathematics education, you know, and get, getting this engagement with um, with new techniques or new to you techniques um, and realising that just actually teaching um, the technical or addressing the technological knowledge and the pedagogical knowledge isn't addressing um, all of the needs. Um, and we also we need to look at what's going on in order to support um, more effectively um, staff development in this area. And our, our, our sort of I guess our underpinning question is to what extent can resistance to online teaching be, be attributed to a lack of experience of artistry? So that was that was what we um, that's what we were looking at. And when we uh, just a quick recap of the of the of the King um, 
uh, model um, for expertise and these three components. And this, I'll just characterize pedagogical content knowledge as, as having the knack. And this is perhaps the thing that we see as most teachable or easiest to teach. And we've got the, the artistry, which is about the, the, you know, the practical um, wisdom and that um, experiencing flow when you're in, in a particular um, scenario or t a teaching situation or whatever you're doing. And then also this aspect of professional learning and mindful of what I think Fiona was saying earlier, recognising that it, p some people might be comfortable with critical reflection when thinking about that. Some might be more comfortable with deliberate practice or progressive um, problem solving. And I think what we were interested in is that the expertise obviously requires all of these. Um, and we were interested in if, if it's the lack of artistry that explains this unease with engaging with um, on online um, teaching and learning and hence the unwillingness to gain the knowledge and engage with the deliberate practice necessary to become more comfortable um, in it. So I'll move on and Mark's going to talk us through um, our versions of the uh, of those three pillars. So um, the three pillars, um, this is basically the, the TPAC model and um, it's the, the the initial pillar, but also bringing in the idea of technological knowledge as well and the ability to work it. And I think in, in we've already brought up in the chat, there's the thing about the craft of online teaching and how does that lead into or build into the um, experience and the expertise with online teaching. And I think the craft is an element here in the same way that just being able to write on a chalkboard uh, legibly is a craft with traditional teaching. So um, I think that needs to be built in and that's part of our model is looking at the acquisition of the craft. But our feeling is that, and what we've observed is that that development of craft is not enough in itself to explain it because why are one group of people developing this craft more slowly than the other? And again, in the chat, we've talked about the Rogers classification and laggards. Why, where does this laggardness, this lag, where does this lagging come from? So we want to look at that. We want to try and use these sorts of questions, to try and unpick what's going on. If we look at the next slide, um, and one of these things is professional learning. So in the previous one, we were talking uh, what the Winchetel talk about techni, which is the idea of craft of teaching and the craft of online teaching, which incorporates being able to use the technologies. Um, but also the there's um, the professional learning. The middle column looks at things like problem solving, I, I think, which is in Helen's chapter. Um, and, but, but also where Sarah's coming from, particularly, is this idea of attitudes and beliefs. And that digs into, again, Winchetel and this idea of epistem and this idea of is an online environment epistemologically valid? And that seems to be something that crops up when people talk about this is. Sometimes it's, I don't like it, but it's also I sh people shouldn't like it. And there's a sort of belief system about the invalidity of being online and talking to each other like this as a as a, an appropriate human endeavor and i think that's cropped up in the chat this morning a bit when we were talking about spontaneity and how it's more difficult to do online but there's a quote that actually but we are doing it and this doesn't feel epistemologically invalid the fact that we're all together sharing expertise but i think we've identified that for some people it does so um and then if we go on to the next slide um, and then the final aspect is flow. And um, <clears throat> okay, so flow, uh, Chink Sent Mahalyi uh, uh, is, is sort of where he's um, a, a lot of that comes from. And uh, aspects of that is automation. So that the more that, and this is a craft, the more that your ability to connect to the environment without having to think about what button to press and of being able to automate those things, those help. Um, also, the pleasure that in, and I think we talked about this about the boundary, and it was as Sam talked about it, about it being difficult but not too difficult. And this is why games are so pleasurable. If the game is very easy, it's not much fun. If it's too hard, it's not much fun. And again, the craft of teaching, if that's just difficult enough, that's when we're feeling like we're in the zone and we're developing things. But also, again, with the onlineness, when you're in a classroom and you are in the zone and you're picking up on what's going on with the different students all of your i don't know your your powerpoints work in the right way the concepts are coming to you you feel this sense of flow 
when this transition to online, then that sense of connectedness and that sense of that immediate feedback from your environment, that's a lot more limited at first. And so we're trying to understand where that comes from and, we're, um, and we'll, we'll skip the rest of this because there's a little bit more to talk about. Next slide, please. So this is where we've come from is that, and that's come out slightly too small on my screen, hopefully not yours, but we might end up, and this is the anticipation, this is the hypothesis, is that we'll, we will see that the reason why some people are laggards and some people are adopters and where this comes from is there's a cycle. There's the craft cycle, they acquire the TPAC techni stuff, they feel the flow because they understand they've got enough craft so it all becomes automated and then they can then enact the artistry of teaching but doing it online because they're getting this um this feedback from everybody and that then engenders positive beliefs about online learning and then they become effective professionally at learning more of the techniques and this could and then alternatively the other way around they don't like the they they think it's wrong they don't learn the craft they therefore struggle to actually acquire the, the craft and the techniques they always feel that it's um they're not part of what's going on and therefore they reject any learning anything more and the what we're curious about as well is if even if these both feedback loops are true where are people keep coming in at is it that they don't know enough about it or are they coming in with different attitudes and beliefs about epistemological validity of, of this as an environment so um uh, next slide and I think we're back over to Sarah's That's stuff. Back. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think we're just about oh. the end. And I'm just going to quickly, because in the anticipation that we might be a bit out of time, just going to quickly um, just just pop up the questions that um, we would pose. I'm going to put those back up in a minute, along with the diagram, which I'm just going to whiz over, um, which I'll put back up. But I just want to quickly highlight this might have then actions for academic development. And, and it, I've just given an example that already starting to sort of try in terms of the implications for our academic and educational uh, development practice. So that we might then sort of looking at the sort of beliefs and attitudes um, towards um, online teaching um, is, is one thing that you might want to explore at the start of a particular development session um, is, is to ask people to invite people to share their preferences for teaching delivery. And I've experienced where staff have said, well, I, I prefer the in-person because I can build a strong bo bond amongst um, students. And then you might pose a problem. How might you create a strong bond between students in online learning environments and what solutions proposed have others, have others used? And open up that dialogue, uh, that professional dialogue. And it may make people then more open um, to considering that how they might achieve that in, in other ways. Um, so that was just the actions for academic development. And I'll just go back to the previous slide and just leave that up there with some questions about whether this connects with your observations and what solutions there are. Um, are we right in thinking it's about this lack of experience of artistry? And we have there on the slide um, where we, how we might categorise um, an attempt to try and understand what's going on. Um, and so, for example, you have those who don't experience artistry of teaching online and um, they don't experience artistry of teaching offline either. And we, we, we our hypothesis this probably didn't affect these um, teachers much at all um, during the during the pandemic. Um, those that do experience artistry, artistry of teaching offline um, and don't um, online either. Um, sorry, those that experience artistry of teaching offline and don't experience artistry teaching online. So this had a seriously negative impact on this category. Um, and then we've got this one group here that we don't, we've not really encountered, and then this other group group over here on, on this table. So does it resonate with you? Are we barking up the wrong tree? Does this model, is, is it a useful model? And we'd like to hear your thoughts and, and comments in the chat as well. Thank you both. Um, one question I'd love to go to um, straight off, and I, I, I know Mark, you, you kind of discussed it a little bit as it came up in the chat, um, was people mentioning the relationship between craft and artistry. Um, so a few of the kind of questions that came out when we were talking about that were, um, <clears throat> does changing the tools in this context um, change the nature of the activity? Uh, and does it change the embodied experiences of teaching? Yes, and I think the embodiment is something that also comes through with a sense of flow and that situated experience is that 
it takes a we used to embodied being embodied in in classrooms because we you know we we do our whole lives with that and that was part of the problem was feeling that same sense of embodiment is also part of that mix for me though i think the useful thing that came out was earlier in the earlier this afternoon which was expertise and artistry aren't necessarily the same thing and you can be an expert in online teaching and not feel embodiment and not feel um artistry and yet still be able to do it effectively and it's understanding why you don't like it may be part of the issue i don't like it because i can't express my artistry i could but that doesn't mean that you can't still be expected to do it it's just understanding why you hate it and getting past that and understanding it's not bad it's just that you're feeling this lab absence of embodiment and then you just need to find techniques for getting around that and still enduring it because it's of benefit and you know the jury's out it if we need online learning because it helps students, you know, that's we're past discussing if it's value or not. It is definitely a value. Therefore, it needs to be incorporated into your practice. And therefore, you need to find ways to get past this sense of alienation and understanding why that alienation exists might be the first step in doing that. That's, I think, our argument. There's an interesting point that's just come in in the chat. Um, Somebody suggesting there might be a third level uh, to this diagram, which is hybrid. Uh, and so their comment is that they're seeing potentially a looming problem in hybrid teaching, where you have some people in the room, some people not in the room, and they have to blend both of these levels uh, at once. Um, just passing that over to you both. Do you want to come in on that, Sarah, or the previous point? Yeah, I, well, I just saw the, the other one of the points that I just saw earlier as well was that, that they sort of resonated in the sense that I think it was there was someone was saying about um I think someone in this group whether it hadn't really impacted them because they just did their slides in the same way you know as mm. they did in person as they did as they did offline in terms of hybrid um sorry what I was just I was just slightly distracted by the do you want to have yeah. a look at the chat and then come back on anything there and then I yeah. will answer that one because um about sort of doing stuff at the same time you can't be embodied in two places you cannot it's very very difficult to therefore express that artistry in two different locations at the same time our advice at durham is don't do it that's the answer <laughs> if you're being expected to do dual mode just get out of a, trying to avoid that i think it's such a difficult thing to achieve uh, effectively that it the 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 real recommendation from um, the learning design people at our, at, you know, in our institution is it should be avoided at all costs. Blended, yet yeah, blended when you're moving from one mode to another, then that's really effective, I think. But trying to teach to two, basically, it's trying to teach to two different classes at the same time. And there are ways to mitigate some of the worst effects of that, but it's never going to be brilliant. And I think using that as, you know, if, if, people hate that then I don't think that's, I don't think there's a way around that I, I and I would try and avoid them that as because that's the most extreme and most difficult and the most alienating of all the different ways of teaching I think the only thing I would add to that is that you if you are going to do it and I've seen it done you you have to use some of the you have to everyone has to be logged into the same team space for example and interacting through the chat box so that you don't get one group of people who uh, 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 in, the, in the room who are having a, a quite a different experience to those people who are joining remotely and you have to manage and plan that quite carefully so I think there may be um, an artistry and, and there may be something around that if, if that is a situation or that you're going to have to offer um, but you need to then there is there is going to be something and it's a also it's a different skill set or it's adapting your skill sets and it's thinking about all these other things for that particular context and, and adapting accordingly so it, it it can be done, but you have to, you, again, you have to adjust all these different elements and, and, and practice in a way, you know, to be able to cope with that with that situation um, and, and ideally have, have one or the other. But, it, but hybrid teaching, um, yes, I think it is going to require thinking through. So Any um, feedback on the, on the model? I mean, sorry, just one question is, does this sound like a plausible, a useful approach, the lack of artistry? Do you think that I might actually unpack some of the issues that people are experiencing with the move to online? Is this worth pursuing? In short, we'd really appreciate feedback at this point. 
We've just had one yes from, from Mary uh, immediately in the feedback. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, but Mary, Mary's on my side all the time anyway with everything <laughs> I do. <laughs> well, it might, might be helpful as a quick kind of um, to test the water. I'm seeing that some people are giving thumbs up to Mary's post, so that might be a quick okay. and easy way That's if people good. are are interested uh, to do, do it in a similar way. Thanks. That's good. Well, we will work on it further. Um, one thing that uh, did come out in relation to this model as well was um, somebody commenting that for the people that um, uh, experience artistry of teaching offline um, and then have to switch to online. Uh, they might have to go through a process of unlearning their face to face teaching skills, and that could be one of the things which led to the kind of agony that they faced during that COVID period. Oh, that's interesting. Sarah, did you want mm. to come in on that? Yeah, I, I think and I, th I think true. that I think that's probably I think that's probably right, but I also think it's um, my experience also that some people find people find some disciplines more difficult to do, especially if they've got, there's a lot of lot of lot of practical um, experience involved, or the reason that you know, and it's also about this, these attitudes as well. That the, the reason I, I went into teaching X is because so that I could have that interaction and, and develop their professional practice. I'm thinking about nursing, you know, um, perhaps other very practical. Um, professional disciplines and I think that's where I've seen some quite strong reactions to to online teaching as well 